Now for tonight's event, I am happy to introduce you to Kenneth Tam. Kenneth Tam works in video, sculpture, installation and photography, and makes work about the performance of masculinity, physical intimacy, and private ritual. Tam received his BFA from the Cooper Union. He has had solo exhibitions at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, MIT List Center for Visual Arts, the Visual Arts Center at UT Austin, Commonwealth and Council, Knight Gallery, Queens Museum, and at the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles. Tam has participated in group shows at the Hammer Museum, Sculpture Center, Queens, and at the Shed. He has participated in residencies including Artist Lab at 18th Street Art Center, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council Workspace, the Core Residency Program at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, Pioneer Works, and at the Kitchen. Tam is a lecturer at Princeton University, a film and video faculty member at Bard's MFA program, and was a visiting lecturer at Harvard University this past fall. He was born in Queens, New York, and currently lives there. Without further ado, we welcome Kenneth Tam. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Charlotte, for that introduction. Um, I just wanted to quickly thank uh, MOCA for bringing this project out to Madison, um, and in particular, Christina Bungart for, uh, for the invitation. And uh, for those that are uh, working this event tonight uh, digitally, uh, thank you, Charlotte, Lucy, and, and Marty uh, for, for doing that, keeping everything um, streaming properly. Um, so I'm gonna set my timer here really quickly. Um, I'm gonna be talking um, a bit about the video that's currently installed right now at MOCA Silent Spikes. Um, I wanna talk about some of the uh, inspirations, I guess, some of the images that I've been working from, um, some of those, I guess, the source material uh, that led me to this project. Um, and also trying to contextualize it a little bit with previous works of mine. Um, because this 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 project is is my most recent work, and it definitely continues the trajectory I've been on. But it it also um, is a slight departure in a couple of ways. Um, and they also wanted to talk a bit also, uh, about um, two films in particular that uh, Mocha might actually be screening screening uh, as part of a, a related uh, film program. Uh, but these two films were quite influential uh, in terms of the themes, um, the images that I wanted to produce for this video. Um, and I think that they're you know, really beautiful works and I thought it might be good to kind of talk about how they function in relationship to, to Silent Spikes. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, I've got a nice little keynote lined up. And this presentation is um, a mixture of mostly still images, but some video clips with sound. Um, and hopefully that all comes through properly um, to you at home. So Silent Spikes is a project that, um, as Charlotte mentioned, was commissioned by the, the Queens Museum. Um, it opened earlier this year and it's traveled to a number of institutions. And um, it's probably my most ambitious project to date, um, combining different kind of, let's say, stylistic elements um, and overlapping strands of research um, that combine into a, a two-channel video. Um, at, at the Queens Museum, it, was, it actually included some sculpture works uh, that we're not able to travel to MOCA, but I'll show you some images of that shortly. Uh, then the first image that I'm that I'm having everyone look at right now is, is from the video. Um, it's, it's a shot of uh, a particular tunnel in Northern California in the Sierra Nevada mountains that uh, is, is pretty important in a number of ways. And I'll 
elaborate on it a bit uh, further into my talk, but I thought it would be good to just kind of start with this image, um, to start with this image of, of, of this space, um, but it's also a void, this sort of um, large uh, uh, empty hole essentially in the side of a, of a mountain. And, it's, and you can't really quite tell the scale of it from this image, but it's, it's quite a large um, excavated hole um, that was the site of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about that history um, later on. But this is an image that, uh, or an image and a space that I thought was quite important in, in conceptualizing the work. Um, and also as one of these kinds of strands that the work um, um, uses. And the space, you know, is also interesting because of its importance in the role uh, that it played in developing the West. Um, when I say that word, you know, perhaps this image is not something that would necessarily come up when we typically think of the West. Um, you know, we still see that with images of you know very expansive uh, uh, landscapes, um, really beautiful kind of sublime um, um, imagery. Um, it's it, you know the West is tied to this certain idea of, of freedom, um, the freedom of movement, freedom to sort of reinvent oneself. Um, so it's interesting to think about how this, this tunnel, this sort of in, totally interior, um, I guess, subterranean space also is part of, of that idea, um, or at least it functions perhaps in contrast to that. Um, a lot of this project was influenced by um, the genre of, of the Western, um, which, you know, this is, this is, I think, something that uh, comes to mind when I, when I say the word Western. Um, again, you know, these gorgeous landscapes, um, really sort of dramatic uh, geological formations um, with, you know, individuals uh, in the foreground, but are, are, are quite small, right? They're, they're dwarfed by uh, uh, these vistas. And there is this sort of like this tension between the individual and these wide open spaces around that. And um, I don't necessarily have a, a particular fondness for the Western. Um, so it's interesting why I, you know, why the project so heavily sort of like draws from that. But I guess I wanted to show some images of just how, um, the genre, even though it might feel quite dated, uh, continues to, um, I don't know, draw our attention and our fascination, even in the present. And in ways that perhaps uh, uh, we may not fully realize. Um, so I just found out the other day, as I was reading randomly, um, I wasn't even going to include this slide in my talk, but it just so happened that I came upon this bit of information, this, this TV show called Yellowstone, which I've never seen. Um, but it apparently is the most watched uh, uh, television program currently. Um, it's already in its fourth season and it, you know, takes place in, in, on a ranch in Montana. Um, and it stars, you know, Kevin Costner, who has played many different kinds of Western figures uh, throughout his career. Um, but I show you this because, you know, even though, again, the Western might feel, um, a bit dated or sort of uh, not, you know, at the forefront of our kind of consciousness when we think about uh, pop culture, let's say, uh, it, it still continues to kind of draw people's imagination, um, you know, for, for various different kinds of reasons. Um, the, the, the trope of the, the cowboy, this figure is still quite alluring, um, despite how sort of um, uh, dated it might feel, let's say. Um, and it kind of reimagines itself, reappears in kind of surprising ways sometimes. Um, this is another uh, film, it's called Concrete Cowboy. Um, it's actually set in a, an urban environment in Philadelphia, and it follows uh, this group of, of black cowboys um, in an entirely urban context. Uh, I haven't seen this show either, but um, it's interesting how, again, it takes these very familiar um, uh, images of 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 the West um, and transplants it into a, a totally different context, but you know, uh, it still draws upon the power of that imagery in similar ways. 
Um, this is a movie that came out this year or last year, uh, The Power of the Dog. Um, it's supposedly also set in, in Montana, um, early 20th century, but it's actually shot in New Zealand by a uh, New Zealand director, Jane Campion, um, with the lead character played by uh, an Englishman, Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, it, it's actually a really beautiful film um, and it kind of subverts a lot of the tropes of, of the Western. Um, but at the same time, still uh, really relishing in the, the visuals, the, the dramatic impact of the, the lone individual in contrast with uh, their sort of surroundings. Um, this is a television show called Westworld that uh, exploits the kind of, it, it uses the Western or the West as a kind of uh, escapist fantasy. Um, people go out into a simulated theme park to, you know, act out their sort of, uh, act on their uh, inhibitions and have uh, um, this sort of, again, this kind of fantasy simulation world uh, for them. And it just so happens to be set in, in the West. Um, so yeah, again, like this, the space that functions as a kind of male oriented uh, 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 escapist kind of fantasy where all of their sort of um, different desires can be indulged. Um, but it's, it's, it's a sci-fi film or television show. Um, the Mandalorian, um, you know, the Star Wars franchise is essentially, I think at its heart, also a Western. Um, looking at this character who's a lone bounty hunter, hunter figure. Um, even in the shot, you know, it, it's, it's so reminiscent of, uh, if you didn't know that they were, you know, uh, uh, riding aliens, you would assume that they were on horseback um, set against what could ostensibly be a Western landscape, but it's supposed to be some sort of distant alien world. But again, it borrows heavily from the tropes of, of a Western film. Um, so this idea of the lone figure, um, who has to kind of embark on this mission, this quest, whatever, uh, on his own against some, some all against all odds is a very kind of sturdy narrative that um, is a staple of of, of westerns. Um, and then these are some examples of western films that I think are, are are slightly more revisionist in the sense that they start to you know bring in characters that typically aren't featured in these films. So this is a film called Last Cow, or sorry, First Cow, The First Cow, not The Last Cow, by Kelly Reichardt. And it talks about these two individuals that meet in the West, I think in Oregon. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's rare um, to see an, an Asian character in this, in this space, in this sort of cinematic space, even though they did exist uh, within that time period. And so much of my project um, thinks about that um, that period and those those individuals that were there, but you know, are, are kind of missing from um, these kind of representational spaces. Um, and then the last example I'll show is this film, or still from the film called *The Nightingale*. Um, the filmmaker, her name escapes me now, but this is actually set in New Zealand, and um, it looks at their uh, the history of their sort of uh, frontier uh, uh, time period, but the uh, it actually allows for the indigenous population to take a large role within the story. So um, I guess that's all to say that, you know, it's interesting to see how the Western is sort of, is, is functional and it's adaptable and it's malleable. Um, and it's allowing these different characters who have traditionally been uh, uh, either totally peripheral or just com just kind of invisible from these histories to start appearing. And this is a kind of space that I was interested in exploring uh, with, with my own project. Um, none of these films or uh, TV shows were necessarily referenced in my In Silent Spikes, but um, again, I thought it was good to kind of just think about how, um, again, the Western as, um, as images, as this idea um, continues to exist in the popular imaginary. So this is what Science Spikes looked like when it was installed at the Queens Museum um, as the two channel video with um, these two sculptures. And the space that it was installed in is, is quite um, <laughs> unusual and a bit challenging to say the least. Um, it's, it's, it's quite different from the installation at MOCA. 
um, at the Queens Museum, it was just quite a cavernous space um, with a lot of strange lines. It had straight walls that were at odd angles with each other, probably not a single right angle in that space, um, but also curved walls. And it had these really high ceilings, maybe 20, 30, 40 feet. I don't remember, but it was, it was felt quite cavernous. Um, and it actually made sense um, in relationship to some of the images that uh, I was using in, in Sun Spikes. Um, this is uh, how the two channels were installed with some of the still images from, um, from the video. Um, I'll show some, some clips from, from Sun Spikes, um, but I, I do hope that people will get a chance to go see the show while it's still up. Um, So again, Silent Spikes is a video that in part plays with some of the conventions of the Western film, as well as the figure of the cowboy uh, while examining forgotten histories of immigrant labor used in the construction of the Western frontier in this country. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask was what happens when a person of Asian descent plays this, this, this character, the cowboy, and, and how might that complicate the portrayal of this figure especially given the absence of diasporic Asians in representations of the frontier, even though they were living and working um, at that time period. And this is just a, a close up of one of the sculptures, which was um, a saddle that was propped up 90 degrees um, on top of this sort of mannequin um, legs and the, the sculptures are actually um, wearing some of, I guess, the costumes that were used in, in the video itself. Um, this next image is just to give it, kind of give you a sense of, again, how strange the space is. Um, and you have to walk through this very narrow, uh, I guess, hallway to enter the space. Um, you might not even have known that the show was in there. Um, but I think it actually worked out quite well. It, it sort of replicated the space of being in the, the tunnel. Um, you know, you really had to, you kind of felt the physical presence of the museum uh, around you um, as you were walking through that, that tunnel. And then all of a sudden it opened up into this much larger cavernous space. Um, so yeah, there's, there are these interesting kind of environmental physical considerations that went into the installation. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about is kind of my process. Um, that's pretty important and, and fairly consistent with a number of my projects. Um, how do I end up working with the, my participants? Um, how do I work with them? What is that um, uh, an engagement like when we're shooting? Um, I worked with five uh, self-identifying Asian American men uh, for Sonnet Spikes. And this is an image of four of them. Um, this still is kind of funny. It looks like a, like a gap ad, like a, a for, you know, if, if it was like Asian American Heritage Month or something and they wanted to sort of create something to celebrate that, um, this is all this denim. But, um, and in, in a lot of my videos, I work with uh, individuals that they're not actors. Um, I'm not interested in working with 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 actors, um, but rather I, I I meet them. I find them through internet postings, um, where I tell them uh, what what the project entails, and they they present them to themselves to me, and they tell me why they're interested in working uh, on 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 whatever project it is. Um, so there's a there's a kind of randomness to it that I think is really interesting that adds the kind of um, awkward, perhaps dynamic that, that happens um, that the camera can pick up on um, when I'm working with them. And this is a way of working that um, has developed over a number of projects of mine. Um, you know, cause I'm, I'm interested in exploring um, the way people perform themselves the way, um, way gender is performed, particularly masculinity. And, and I think that that performance is happening constantly 
even uh, without the presence of a camera. Um, but the way I use a camera is just to kind of like allow for some of these uh, um, performances to be, I guess, bracketed so that you understand that it's a performance. And, and what happens when um, the script, you know, the, the internalized script that we all have, um, let's say no longer sort of functions properly, or when, you know, I'm asking someone to do something that takes them out of um, their, their comfort zone or their sort of, again, their their day-to-day their -day performed self. Um, and this certainly happens within Silent Spikes. Um, and also with um, this still, which is from an earlier project of mine called Breakfast in Bed, which I made while I was in residence in, in Houston. And um, it involved working with seven men that I, that I met through various internet postings. And um, they gathered at my studio um, for, for seven weeks. Um, we only shot one, I should say, that we shot one night a week for two hours a night for seven consecutive weeks. And we generated this footage. Um, and ostensibly, I was creating, um, you know, my version of like a men's social club or something. But in actuality, what was happening in that space was, was quite, quite different. And perhaps um, you can't even really uh, uh, identify what that, what was happening there, which was kind of the point, which was what I was really interested in doing and, and gathering these men and allowing them to perform themselves differently. Um, so I'm gonna show like a, a quick three, four minute clip of the project so you can get a sense of what this actually entailed. Um, and there is audio, so I hope uh, you can hear it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Attractive fellow, you look like you uh, do a lot of work to keep, take care of yourself. I know you ride your bike regularly, and I know you're out there hitting the streets all the time, and it, it shows, man. You look good. Grow it about another four inches, you'll be knocking them dead, brother. Hi, Brandon. Jordan, uh, I noticed that you're you're shorter than me, and uh, that was good. I noticed that. Uh, how your shoulders slope down and your belly comes out. And I noticed like, what I noticed really is these little, like the gray parts of your oh, stubble, yeah. like not the gray hair that's coming out, it's what's on your face, the stubble, it just looks like little specks of white. Um, you're a beautiful person. Are you guys on the my friend? Yeah. Um, let's go in the other direction then. Come on, that's to state the film. So are we doing compliments or just like anything? It doesn't have to be numbers. Numbers. <laughs> 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 You don't have to be mean, but no, no, I'm not gonna be mean. I'm just gonna like say what I'm Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Observate, yeah. Neutral observation. Uh, yeah, yeah, neutral moment. observation. That's what I do. That's <laughs> 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 my thing, man. Um I noticed you have a lot of hair coming out of your uh, shirt. It's black and curly, and it's like it pours out of your shirt. Uh, you have long, thick hair. It's like a padding or something. Uh, 
blue eyes that can catch my attention. Uh, there's like a little mole here that's underneath the skin. You can't see it unless you're up close. I've noticed that. And, uh, you're tall, fit, handsome. Nico, I'm entirely jealous of your swarthy complexion. I wish I could be as, as dark headed and as dark haired and as dark skinned as you are. You're stocky and, and thick, something that I've, I've never really had for myself. I've had to make do with being lanky and skinny my whole life. It's been a struggle. You make me jealous, sir. Um, and <laughs> whenever I watch this, uh, I forget how many questions someone must have if they are not uh, familiar with the, the context around what they're watching. Um, but I don't have enough time to necessarily go into this project in, in great detail. But if people have questions about what they just saw, um, they can certainly uh, ask me at the end during the Q&A. Um, but I, I, I show this project because um, it's really um, you know, it kind of set a certain template for, for the way that I work with my participants. Um, again, in ways that um, is unrehearsed. Um, there's no scripted dialogue that we use. I'm the person holding the camera actually um, and asking, asking the, the questions. Um, so it's about creating this kind of intimate space, um, but at the same time, having them do things that, that you know, requires a certain amount of vulnerability and again, it takes them out of the way in which they think they can kind of perform themselves, um, or at least puts that into question um, because of the things that I'm asking them to do. Um, it's certainly, um, there are certainly absurd elements to it, but it's also quite tender and I think um, quite revealing of, of, of so many things, um, uh, particularly about, again, the performance of gender. Um, another project of mine called All of M used um, the high school prom as a way to kind of look at similar ideas. Um, and again, I gathered uh, a, a group of men, um, adult men, and also high school students um, to kind of reenact um, the prom, the high school prom, but in a kind of different way. And again, thinking about the kinds of private rituals that exist. Uh, or in this case, the, the problem is a, is a private one, but um, thinking about the kinds of rituals that exist that allow for certain kinds of intimacy to, to take place. And this video um, kind of played with, with those conventions um, and created a, a different kind of social space for, for my participants. Um, and that leads me to, to Science Spikes, where, um, again, even though it's quite different, I think, um, from the previous two projects, I still borrow some of the um, activities, let's say, that that we did in, in breakfast in bed. You know, particularly the the speaking scenes where I asked uh, each of the men to kind of um, basically improvise some some kind of uh, comment about the other person. Um, this image is uh, uh, showing these scenes that were shot in a, a black box theater in, in New York City um, at, at the kitchen, actually, people are familiar with that performance venue, uh, where uh, my participants were doing these improv movement sessions. I had a, I had a choreographer um, there who helped them come up with some kind of movement sequence. And a lot of my projects, particularly Science Spikes, uses movement. Um, movement in a way that's not entirely choreographed, um, movement in a way that's not done by trained bodies, by people who have any dance experience. Um, none of my performers were, were trained dancers in any particular way. And I'm, I'm interested in how a movement that is performed, aesthetic movement, let's say, performed by untrained bodies is also a way of uh, producing a certain kind of vulnerability. Um, in, in this case, I, I set it up, set it up so that one person was kind of performing for the other. Um, Alfred was performing for Virgo, holding the camera. But in a way, there, you know, I thought of it, this is actually um, kind of like a pas de deux, um, which is a term for for two people dancing together. Um, even though one person was holding a camera, I thought that there were still sort of um, their movements, or you know, there were still. Um, 
bound up together in this in this moment, in this in this little um, improvised scene that Alfred performs, and this occurs in a number of times in Sound Spikes. Um, and again, you know, I, I'm really interested in how um, the body can perform a certain kind of vulnerability when it's asked to do something that um, is, is, is expressive, um, but also unfamiliar at the same time. Um, this is a scene um, where I have one of my participants speaking again in an improvised fashion in response to this idea of sensuality, what, what they think that word means, the sensuous. Um, and that, that idea also plays um, a, a big role in, in Silent Spikes. And I'll play this little clip of Anaf speaking. Um, so I think just from the fact that it was like really soft and sort of like my hand just went into it and that there was like little like fur fibers or like it's not really fur, it's like cotton, whatever. But like it was just like really soft and really smooth. I sort of get that uh, sensation sometimes when I like rub my arm like up one way or my hair is not, like my hair is pointing one way and then I rub it up one the other direction and then it just like all falls down. It's sort of like that similar feeling of sort of like building up tension and then releasing tension like through like uh, like a feeling sort of and how like certain like textures specifically for me like soft textures of like fur and like cotton and like I guess like my hair kind of um, sort of feels like I guess sensual yeah um, and the the sensuous um, figures into this project too as a way of, again of, of uh, or another way of, of complicating uh, the a performance of masculinity. I think there's a way in which that idea of, of pleasure through the senses is something that is often um, thought of as a, as a kind of a negative. Um, it's treated with you know a certain amount of shame or stigma uh, within sort of normative masculinity. And with my participants, I actually wanted to to embrace that. Or, or speak about that, or see how that how they understand that term, um, and even kind of perform that. You know, with a lot of the the, the activities, the kind of images that I had them produce, um, were, were really leaning into uh, creating sensuous images, or thinking about how that could complicate the the performance of their of their masculinity, um, especially you know when they're dressed up as cowboys. Um, so for example, uh, skip ahead to, let's say this sequence here um, where I have Theo um, perform these movements that are actually derived from, from bull riding. Um, I show them a number of, of YouTube videos of people practicing bull riding without the bull. Um, and there was something about that movement that looked like choreography to me. It looked like some sort of a very aestheticized series of movements. And I wanted them to perform that in a kind of decontextualized way to kind of reveal um, these more sort of sensuous qualities in an activity that one would typically associate with being, you know, hyper-masculine um, and, 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 you know, quite aggressive, you know, the body sort of like gyrating with the bull. And so you end up with something that um, is a bit strange and, but alluring at the same time. And that's the kind of the quality that, that tension that I was interested in producing um, with my participants. So I'll play this. So again, trying to, to complicate this figure um, of, of the cowboy through physical movement alone. Um, 
and this happens a, a number of times in the video. Um, I'm just going to go back to a sequence I skipped, which is uh, Virgo speaking with, with Alfred. And, you know, they're doing something similar to what was happening in Breakfast in Bed, where the men were each kind of uh, improvising some sort of comment about the other person. And, uh, of course, it's, it's funny and it's awkward and sort of cringe inducing. But at the same time, I think it says something about how um, men, you know, very simply look at and think about other men. Um, and the sort of like convoluted, um, unpracticed, but still sort of um, tender way. And I had um, my participants here do a version of that as well, which I'll play right now. Virgo, I think uh, that you are a very nice guy, uh, just by how you treat people, uh, how you speak to them, very kind. Uh, I think you're very intelligent. Um, if without that intelligence, I don't think you could achieve what you've done so far, especially in the industry you're in. Uh, I also think that you are a very good looking guy um, with great height. Um, sometimes a little envious of the height, but um, I think that you are uh, have a lot going for you, you um, positive things, great things. Um, you know, but overall, I think that you are a nice guy and attractive guy. Um, someone told me that this felt like some, like a like a scene from a dating show or something, um, where these two are meeting for the first time and have to, you know, come up with with assessments about the other person on the spot, and and again, you know, it's 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 it, it is very awkward to hear, um, but I think you know I'm interested in these kinds of awkward moments because I think they they kind of I see them as disruptions to, um, again, the, the, the learned way in which we um, perform ourselves. Um, and um, this is another series of sequences in the video where each of my participants is, is again, like trying to um, reenact these bull riding movements. Um, again, you know, they, they, they're only, they're only doing this from what they're seeing from videos. They, they've never actually done this themselves. So it's, it's highly interpretive. Um, and in this sequence in particular, I've slowed it down a bit to, um, to really heighten the, um, the aesthetic qualities of this movement of this kind of strange hip thrusting movement that they're doing. Um, and I'll play um, just a little bit of it. Do you think that you are an individual? Do you feel that you have to hide yourself? Do you think that you are somebody else? You have to I cut off, but that was um, Alfred. Um, the voiceover was of Alfred um, uh, uh, asking a series of questions that were in re response to a, to a different prompt. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the actual sort of historical significance of the tunnel. Um, this is the kind of this, the, uh, one of the larger strands that uh, uh, filters or, or weaves its way through through the video. Um, and this is the image that I start out with. And I just kind of wanted to go over briefly some of the history of the transcontinental railroad for those that are not familiar with it. Because um, I, I do think it's it's kind of important to, to understand um, this, this bit of context. Um, uh, this is a, you know, a very sh stripped down uh, uh, version of, of, of its history, but basically it was a, a project that uh, originated during the Civil War. Um, President Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, um, was the one that actually um, initiated it. And there was to be a railroad that originated in Omaha, Nebraska, and would end up on the West Coast, actually ended up in Sacramento. Um, and the plan was that from both of these cities, they would start building the railroad and it would ultimately meet up in the center somewhere. 
in, in this case, it ended up being Utah. And part of the impetus for building this railroad is, you know, other than the obvious things like trade um, and, and, you know, allowing people to, to end up to get to California um, was that Lincoln thought that it was a way to kind of unite the country after the horrors of, of the Civil War. And, um, you know, he, he, he unfortunately didn't even live to see the, uh, the, the construction of it. Um, but that was kind of part of the thinking um, behind this massive infrastructure project, um, which, you know, at the time was, was one of perhaps the largest infrastructure project in, in the world. Um, and the segment of the tunnel that you see in Sound Spikes is actually this place called China Wall um, in the Sierra Nevada mountains in um, California on the border of Nevada. You can see the little pin that I dropped um, showing you exactly where it is in relationship to California. Um, and here it is sort of um, showing it more up close. It's, it's very close to Lake Tahoe, if anyone is familiar with that part of California. Um, it's really beautiful alpine landscape, um, gorgeous uh, space. Um, and part of the significance for shooting that particular tunnel or that section of the tunnel, because there are many, many miles of tunnels that you know, they had to blast through to, to, to create this railroad was that um, in 1867, uh, I discovered this during my research, was that uh, the Chinese uh, laborers that were working, um, that were the, the largest contingent of workers on the Western end of the Transcontinental Railroad um, decided to strike, um, asking for, um, for better wages, you know, uh, for shorter workdays, a reduction to, to a 10 hour workday um, and shorter shifts during the most dangerous parts of the job such as blasting the tunnels. You know, these are, these are demands that seem very reasonable and, and, and quite familiar um, even in the present day. And um, it was remarkable to learn about this history um, because so often, you know, these individuals, these migrant laborers, if, if they were mentioned at all in history, they were, you know, usually just a, a kind of a footnote within the larger um, story about the construction of this railroad. And I think, you know, now they're perhaps devoting more attention to, to these workers, um, but I'd never heard about the strike before. And um, it happening at all was quite impressive because um, about 5,000 workers all of a sudden stopped working. Um, and it was, they never found out exactly how they were able to communicate with each other because the, um, the length of the work site um, was about 20 some odd miles. You know, it was from Cisco to Truckee. Uh, it was a pretty long stretch of, of, of the railroad and they were all able to simultaneously stop working. Um, and, it was quite a feat and totally caught the, the construction managers off guard. They didn't realize it was happening at all. Um, and it, to this day, no one really knows how they were able to communicate over such a vast distance and to do it um, without anyone finding out. Um, but it was also really powerful to learn about this because it made you realize that these workers um, knew um, that they were being treated unequally, that the, 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 the white workers who are largely uh, Irish were, were getting paid better and were getting treated better. And they felt that there was uh, something wrong with that. And they were, able, they were willing to, to sort of fight for their demands. Um, and to conduct a labor strike at this point in history was, was really unheard of. And so all of these things proved to be really remarkable and really changed the way in which I thought about these individuals and, you know, in the ways that um, they perhaps understood themselves, that they were not merely just sort of disposable units of labor, um, but that they had sort of they had dignity and um, realized that they were being um, um, dehumanized um, by, you know, by their treatment. And so that was something that I wanted to incorporate into, into Silent Spikes. Um, this sort of forgotten um, um, history. Um, not only, you know, again, not only uh, uh, was their presence sort of, uh, you know, these, these workers um, largely written out of history, but this particular event, which seems so, um, I don't know, so transformational 
in, in my understanding of how these people thought about themselves. And unfortunately, you know, the strike never actually did not succeed. Um, the, the manager who was in charge of them, in charge of all these workers, um, decided to just stop feeding them. They, they cut off their supply lines and basically starved them out um, while they were striking. Um, the, the workers, I think, lasted for about a week before they realized that they couldn't continue. Um, and it, it might be too simple to, to, to say that, you know, this, even though they were, their demands were not met, that the strike was, was unsuccessful. I think that if you think about it in terms of a larger um, scope of history, um, you know, the, while this, uh, while they were not able to, to get higher wages um, or um, equal treatment, it, it definitely set, you know, it kind of changed the way in which we think about migrant laborers and unmarginalized workers. Um, it sort of expands the notion of who these people are and what they're capable of. And again, um, not just as people that we, we tend to think of as disposable and anonymous and interchangeable, but as um, individuals that, you know, had a sense of, of, of their self-worth. And it was this, this, this sense, this, this, um, the sense of humanity that I wanted to bring into Summit Spike. So there's a, a large portion of the video where um, there's a kind of fictionalized narrator, um, or sorry, there's a, there's, a, there's a fictional narrator recounting a story of, of, of him being in a tunnels um, and what that experience was like working in there and um, being in there with, with the other workers. And um, part of the disappearance of this history of these individuals is um, a result of the fact that there was no written documentation uh, uh, by the workers themselves. There's no uh, sort of extant um, physical evidence, written evidence of their experiences, um, at least not that I'm aware of. And so I decided to, to, to create one um, that, you know, fit as, as best as I imagined what their experience was like. And that, uh, that voiceover occurs uh, during some of the shots where you're moving through the tunnel. Um, and there's a lot I can talk about with, with just why I decided to do that, um, how I came up with that, that narrative. And it's something I've never done before. I've never written a script. I've never written um, any kind of fictional uh, voice for any of my character or participants before um and but it was you know i felt it was necessary to kind of like put that that voice into the project because again so much of of, of silent spikes was about thinking the lack of a certain kind of representation or um the way in which certain figures are not allowed to play characters even though they exist in in the space even though you know asians uh, diasporic asians existed in the west building its infrastructure working, living, um, they've been sort of largely written out of the representational space. And so I thought that it was important not to, not to just write them back in, but allow that perspective to kind of complicate our understanding of the West in general. Um, because, you know, I'm not just gonna play this shot of, of a camera moving in here. Um, as I was making this video and just thinking more about this tunnel, you know, the, this idea of the void became really important. Um, not just as a reference to the specific strike, but just this idea of, of an absence, an absence in the land, landscape, an absence in history, um, the disappearance of certain kinds of bodies and certain kinds of histories and, and what that meant. And um, there's a, a historian that I discovered as I was doing my research, because his name is Simeon Mann, um, who basically um, paraphrasing his, his idea was, but was it was that while it's important to, to um, you know, talk about this history, talk about these histories of um, marginalized uh, uh, communities that have been largely sort of left out of the larger narrative, um, it's, it's not adequate to just sort of write them back in and think that um, one's work is finished. I think the fact that they, these histories are left out is also really important to kind of ruminate on um, because, you know, that says so much about really the way in which, um, I don't know, the history of this country is, is constructed 
and 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 passed on these these intentional sort of absences and ways in which um, individuals that don't fit in to a, a larger narrative um, end up being edited out. And it's important to kind of remember those absences. It's important to kind of keep those absences, um, not to not to just remove them, um, but to remember. You know these people that the, these stories were removed in the first place and for me these tunnels are that kind of reminder there's a sort of void in space even though uh well now if you go to the site there's a bit of history there's some didactic panels there that kind of tell you a bit about the history but i find the this large sort of um empty space in the mountain to be a, a really compelling kind of symbol um or, or, or metaphor, I guess, for how um, for how this nation sort of remembers its own history. Um, that there are often many, many of these voids that exist, right? These massive sort of um, perhaps you know in, intentional absences um, that uh, we choose not to sort of include in the larger narrative. And I think that's a really um, compelling um, way of thinking about um, history. Um, I'm kind of almost at time, um, but I'll, I'll quickly just run through my, my remaining slides, which is uh, I wanted to talk about or just share at least these two films, which were quite important uh, in terms of thinking about this project. Um, one is called Mountain Patrol K.K. Shi Li, a 2004 film by a mainland Ch Chinese filmmaker named Lu Chuan. And then, um, the Rider by Chloe Zhao, probably familiar to some people, um, made in 2015. And both of these films, I think, are um, really stunning, um, but also these somewhat revisionist takes on the Western. Um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're both made by uh, uh, two people that are not from the US. You know, Chloe Zhao lives and works in, in here now, but um, I think she brings a distinctly kind of uh, uh, a perspective that uh, you would not see from someone that, um, say, lived and grew up in, in the U.S. And both of these films um, are, are essentially Westerns, but um, reveal something quite different, reveal a kind of vulnerability in their male uh, lead characters that I've never really seen in any other Western. Um, so Mountain Patrol K.K. Shili actually takes place in Western China in the sort of Tibetan uh, uh, mountainous regions. It's actually, it's not Tibet, but it is the part of China that borders it. And it follows these group of Tibetan, um, I guess, uh, 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 um, I don't know how to describe them necessarily. They, they're they a band of self-appointed protectors of the Tibetan antelope, this endangered species of antelope. And they go around catch, looking for poachers. Um, the skins of these animals are quite valuable, uh, even though it's illegal to, to kill them, um, poachers exist and are slowly decimating these, these species um, native to, to, to Tibetan areas of China. And um, it takes place in these gorgeous landscapes that are reminiscent of, of you know, the Western United States, um, constantly contrasting these lone individuals against this rugged, um, forbidding um, and treacherous environments. And, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful film, but again, it, it emphasizes the vulnerability of these characters and their sort of affection for each other, the sort of band of individuals that are, are they're, uh, constantly kind of exploring their emotions, or at least the film is, and allowing us to feel great empathy for their struggle. Uh, and as you can imagine, they are totally outmatched. Um, the story doesn't end with a happy ending. Um, and it's not, it's not triumphant, triumphant in any way, except that um, it's so much about seeing these, the passion that these individuals have for protecting their, 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 their culture uh, and the resources and, or the indigenous species that are a part of it. Um, and then this other film, which got some acclaim in the US, um, looks at, um, this is the writer, it looks at, um, it's set in the present day, um, a, uh, a rodeo rider who's been injured and because of his injury has to kind of reevaluate his entire life um, and what he is able to do, um, particularly as a young man living in, I believe, North or South Dakota. Um, 
it's it's a really again a really beautiful film that draws from all the conventions of a western, but at the same time shows um, this incredible vulnerability and really questions um, ideas about uh, a contemporary masculinity and what happens when um, you can no longer perform at that uh, with those expectations. Um, here is a shot of oh, and, and she also uses non actors, which is really amazing. Um, this is a scene where uh, the protagonist is meeting with his friend who also was a bull rider until he was uh, uh, injured and is now living um, in this in this rehab facility, I guess. Um, and it's, it's, it's really touching. It's really moving to see this, the, the, the film explore this relationship. But again, it's a, it's a pretty harsh critique of a certain kind of masculinity. Um, and it really sort of questions what um, questions like what in, in what ways are, are are these individuals allowed to perform themselves? What's 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 left when um, they don't have access to uh, uh, or are able to perform in these sort of particular physical ways uh, in which they've been sort of raised their entire lives? Um, you know, they're sort of economically disadvantaged as well. Um, you see them struggle. And I don't know, it just, we, crafts is really sort of empathetic, um, but a kind of heartbreaking story about um, the, the lives of young men. And I just wanted to quickly show, these are just my last slide, some of the images that really inspired me from this film. So this is them practicing bull riding on this device called the drop barrel. And you know, I, I made my own for this video, but again, I, I, you know, the way in which I shot this was to highlight the sort of the movement, um, the aestheticized kind of, semi-choreographic aspects of, of them practicing. Um, and then there are all these shots of, of um, the protagonist with his horse who, um, spoiler alert, he ultimately has to kill um, because it's injured. And that's a really kind of traumatic moment in the film. Um, and I kind of, you know, pay homage to that uh, through this kind of absurd version with Virgo holding the calf head. But again, trying to sort of, um, highlight the, the, the more tender moments um, in, 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 a, in a genre film that tends to um, avoid those kinds of images. And uh, that's it, that is my last slide. So I will stop sharing. Um, I hope that was uh, not too uh, overwhelming, but uh, thank you. It wasn't overwhelming at all. It was fabulous on so many levels. Thank you very much. Um, uh, um, wow, I, I really appreciate you also um, uncovering, showing us the hidden parts of history and how they speak about our nation. Um, so interesting. I wanna also um, piggyback to your comments about the two films to announce to everyone that we will be showing um, the writer here at the museum um, in our lecture hall on Thursday, um, February 10th at 7 p.m. And then uh, the following Thursday on February 17th at 7 p.m., we will be showing Mountain Patrol. So you can see those two films that Ken mentioned and talked about. Amazing, that's so great. Yeah, I'm excited. We do have a question for you, a couple questions, but we may not be able to get to all of them, but I will ask you one question if that's okay. Yes, um, please. Okay. The question is, I've noticed in your work, there are similar conversational prompts and themes. Are you guiding these? As you are examining the nexus between masculinity, gender, economics, and race, what have been the most surprising things revealed in these conversations? Where are you finding surprising similarities and differences at this intersection? Wow, um, that's a, those are big questions, great questions, but the big, uh, maybe I'll just answer the, the, the easiest one, which was about how I guide these activities and what perhaps what my role is uh, uh, behind the camera. Um, and, and like I said, I, you know, none of the speaking parts or even really the, the, the physical perform parts are rehearsed. Um, I have a loose frame that I come in with. Obviously I have the activity in mind, but how it actually gets performed or how 
um, it, it gets kind of figured out by my participants is, is largely done in an, again, an improvised way. Um, we certainly do multiple takes of things, um, but I try to keep it, I, I try to keep my, my directorial inter, uh, um, intervention to a minimum. Um, I'm, I'm much more interested in, in how they respond to these prompts and how they, um, let's say, uh, choose to answer them or not answer them. I think, you know, the most surprising things, the most interesting responses are the ones that I don't think of, uh, the ones in which they are doing something that um, really surprises me that, 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 like, again, like reveals some, some sort of vulnerability within them, I guess. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. It's something that, you know, is so much about my process is just like being very present with them, <clears throat> with them when we're shooting and just kind of allowing things to kind of happen. And, um, and, and yeah, you know, sometimes they, the, the most uninteresting things are actually when they are trying to perform in ways where they, they're trying to give me what they think I want, right? They're, they're trying to perform in such a way that they're giving me um, what they think is the right response. And I, and that tends to be the, the least interesting response. I'm much more, uh, uh fascinated by how they interpret these things and, and how they, you know, how they negotiate their own sort of discomfort, let's say, um, but yet are still willing to kind of go into that space. Um, and then, um, I guess the other two questions are just, uh, I just wrote the word surprising question mark. Um, what was, what has been the most surprising? Um, I guess perhaps the fact that um, the people that I work with are willing to do the things that they're, they end up doing, not to say that I, uh, I ask a great deal from them, but that, that they are willing to um, explore um, these, their, these more vulnerable aspects of, of themselves in front of a camera with a group of strangers. It's certainly something that I wouldn't, it's a situation I would never put myself into. So I'm always um, very appreciative, but also again, um, yeah, surprised that they're, that they're willing to do this and to kind of go on this, um, let's say journey with me. Um, it takes, you know, so much of these projects are about building trust with my participants, um, getting to the point where they are, feel comfortable not being comfortable, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and then in terms of how, you know, all these different themes overlap, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think at the end of the day, individuals are much more than just these particular characteristics. I think that, you know, we're all very complex people, even though my projects tend to focus on the performance of, of gender and also race and, 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 and labor. Um, you know, they are, the people that I work with are, are more than the sum of their parts. They're more than just these sort of descriptions alone. And I try to kind of find ways to kind of reveal that complexity, even though I would never call my work documentary in any way. Um, but I, I am interested in getting to something, um, I, I don't know, uh, something that sort of surprises me about, um, about their kinds of performances, let's say. I, I hope that answers the question. It does answer the question. Thank you so much. Um, I'm mindful of our time. I, I feel like we have so much that we would love to talk about with you further. It was fabulous to have you tonight. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess we should probably say goodbye for now. Um, we're looking forward to those films in the next couple of weeks. And I wanna say thank you to our members who keep the museum free. Please visit us soon and often. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have a good night. Thank you everyone, good night.